So I'm Madeline Parr. I am a senior political science and international relations major, but outside of academics, I am one of the leaders of Carleton's aptly named outdoor club, Canoe, um, or Carleton's Association for Outdoor and Nature Enthusiasts. Um, Canoe seeks to make the outdoors accessible to everyone, um, regardless of experience or background. We just want to get people outside. So, and this goal is shared by today's convocation speaker, Emily Ford, who I am incredibly honored to introduce to you now. Emily Ford is an aspiring uh, winter adventurer and through hiker from Duluth, Minnesota. She has spent many a night on trail experiencing the often forgotten Midwestern wilderness through the power of her own two feet and her trusty companion, Diggins, um, an Alaskan Husky. In 2020, Ford completed the 1,200 mile Ice Age Trail, crossing Wisconsin east to west, um, starting on a bay in Lake Michigan in Potuatomi State Park and ending at the Minnesota border in St. Croix State Park. Her, trip, her trek took 69 days, all in the dead of winter, um, braving the below zero temperatures we all complain about and in our short spurts between buildings. Her strength and perseverance were captured in a short documentary film, Breaking Trail. Last winter, Ford completed a solo 180 mile ski route across the Boundary Waters canoe area, once again with, Digg with Diggins. This journey was also captured in the documentary film, A Voice for the Wild, which premiered at the 2022 Banff Center Mountain Film and Book Festival and raised awareness about the threats to the Boundary Waters posed by copper mining. Because in her words, a place like the Boundary Waters only exists if we protect it. Emily Ford adventures with an understanding and drive that shows everyone and anyone they deserve to discover the outdoors, regardless of their race, gender identity, or upbringing. Her goal is to make sure everyone knows they're welcome in the outdoor space and that no one should ever feel that nature is not for that. She continues to seek out new adventures and represent the underrepresented in outdoor spaces. And with that, please welcome Emily Ford to Carleton College. Hi, everybody. I'm Emily. Wouldn't that be weird if I was like, hey, <laughs> I'm not Emily. Can you, you know how you can like kind of ghost write? Can you have ghost speakers? You just be like, well, I'm not her, but here's her presentation. I think I like that. I would just sit in the crowd, actually, and just grade them on how well they do my talk. I think I'd like that. Uh, it's kind of a wild ride. I like to call this presentation The Longest Way, uh, mostly because of how I first got recognized, and it's 10 things I've learned on the trail. <clears throat> when I first started this presentation, it was seven things I learned on the trail, and kind of every year I just add on, so in like 10 years, my presentation's gonna be three hours long, and it's gonna be like 100 things I've learned on the trail. <laughs> It'll be awesome. It'll be like a multi-part session. But one of the ways most people heard about me is by doing this lovely trail here. It's called the Ice Age Trail. It goes across to Wisconsin from Potawatomi State Park to Interstate State Park here in Minnesota, which if you've never been to Interstate State Park, highly recommend it. It's a beautiful state park. There's this huge gorge uh, where the river runs through, and it's awesome. It is 1,200 miles, and I call it the longest way across Wisconsin because I think it's... Remarkable that they fit a 1,200-mile trail uh, in Wisconsin. It's not a gigantic state, but somehow they squiggled it through. And it is squiggled through the way it is because it uh, outlines the last glaciation uh, that was seen in Wisconsin. So that's why it looks the funny shape that it does. And if you're curious about uh, yourself splitting in, in half right there in the middle and sending half of you one way and half of you the other, that's called the bifurcation and there's just a long, hot debate amongst those who made and are still working on the Ice Age Trail about which way to actually go and what part uh, the glacier actually extended all the way to. So if you're wondering, I did take the left side. I followed trail magic. Some lady stopped me on the road once, and she said, I have a key card to... <laughs> trail magic is funny. If you don't know what trail magic is, it's... Um, really magical things that pop up on the trail via other humans. And there was a lady that said, I have a key card to this cabin that I rented at Christmas Mountain. If you would like to go, here's my key card. And I was like, this sounds amazing and dangerous all at the same time. Absolutely, I will go. And it was awesome. So I took the Western route with Diggins and I snuck her into this cabin. Um, I don't really have a reason other outside of that. But it's a huge, hot debate. One of the biggest things that people ask me all the time is how do you keep going, right? 1,200 miles is a lot, 
180 miles skiing in the Boundary Waters is a lot. Even um, sometimes getting up is a lot, right? Waking up in the morning, it's tough. Um, and what I've learned here is number one, take a buddy. A lot of you know my buddy, this is Diggins, my beautiful best friend. <laughs> I have both my best friends in the truck. Zulu's also there, but this is the one most people know. She is now five years old. She's an Alaskan Husky. And for this trip, I asked to borrow her uh, because I have another dog, but he is much, much more made for the summertime. He's part Catahoula, which means he's a short-haired hunting dog, and the deep winter's not really meant for him. And so I was online, uh, Facebook, a buddy of mine's like, there's this female musher page you can uh, post questions to. So I was like, hey, <clears throat> single woman looking for a single dog for a 1,200-mile adventure. <laughs> Is there any takers? And people are like, absolutely not. That's crazy. And I was like, Nice. But one lady did say yes. Her name is Sherry Beatty of Beatty Family Farms. Uh, her daughters uh, race. They uh, run Bear Grease. I think one day they would love to run Iditarod, which is awesome. Uh, they had Diggins. They had just gotten her from the Reddington family. And she had her puppies, and she was ready to go. But COVID really threw a hitch into a lot of running for mushers, uh, so she was up for grabs. Um, I always liken her to Tarzan. I'm realizing Tarzan is becoming kind of an outdated uh, film for this presentation, but when I first met her, she had never done a lot of things that maybe your dogs have done. Here's a case in point. If you walk your dog around town, and there's a drain grate, right, in the road, usually your dog goes around it. That's not the case for Diggins. She had never seen one before. She shoved her paw right in between the drain grate, and she looked at me like it was my fault. And I said, no, this is your fault. Get yourself out of it. The second thing I've learned, this is a three-parter, is that A, have a plan. I am a very, very extremely type B person. Uh, I like to be on the fly. I like last minute. Procrastination is, ooh, I love it. I love the pressure. Mm, it's nice. But for this, of course, to stay alive in the winter, I had to have a great plan. I had spreadsheets. I had contacts. I had everything ready. How much food to eat, how, much, how many calories per meal was I gonna consume, how was I gonna get my food drops, how many people do I need for my food drops, where am I gonna sleep every night, it was amazing, um, how was I gonna transport all my things, and it was awesome, and then I learned quickly as I started, just throw everything that is unnecessary out. One thing that you see in this photo, this beautiful Diggins on one side, I kept her, she was part of the plan that stuck and stayed in the plan. But on the right side is the sled. And this is the only picture I have of this sled, which is why it's such a crappy picture. <laughs> the sled did not last long, right? For a lot of winter expeditions, you'll see people pulling a sled. We call them pulks. Um, I've invested in a much better pulk now uh, as I've aged and matured. Uh, one thing about the Ice Age Trail people don't know is that it is 500 miles of road walking. So out of the 1,200 miles, you will walk 500 miles on a road. So I can't be dragging a sled on the hard gravel. You pretty much wear a hole, right, in the first 20 miles. I was like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna build this contraption so where I can flip it underneath, I'm gonna put wheels on, I'm gonna strap my sled to it, I'm gonna roll it down the road, it's gonna be awesome, then when I'm gonna snow, I'm gonna sled it across because it's a sled. This thing was the worst thing I've ever built in my life. I hated it. It would, it would drag, it would flip, it w it, the snow was wrong and it was awful, so I ended up actually getting rid of this sled uh, and my first, uh, my first drop person took it home actually. Um, and it was a good riddance. The downside of that was that I had to carry all the gear that I needed that was in my sled, so my pack turned out to be about 65 pounds. Not recommended, but necessary. 2C of this for your notes, roadblocks. There were little, little roadblocks. Uh, a lot of the times, not a lot, a few of the times, the trail would just be closed. There's a lot of maintenance that needs to happen. There's a lot of behind the scenes that happens for trails. Trails don't just pop up out of nowhere. There are lots of groups that make trails happen, uh, and it takes money for trails to continue to be made. Number two is that it was just cold, right? And I made a mistake. Here I was in the airport getting really excited for this trip. I was, I think I was doing a shoot in Idaho and I was like, oh, I know I have money so I'm gonna buy a really nice sleeping bag. I was on the Western Mountaineering website and here I am typing along and they're like, they're minus 30 degree bag. I was like, awesome. I thought I clicked on that bag, wrong. I clicked on the zero degree bag. And if you know anything about sleeping bags, zero degrees or the degree of the bag is your survival degree, right? I went through this whole trip thinking I had a minus 30 degree bag. I had no idea I had a zero degree bag, uh, which is wild to think about the temperatures I slept in. 
and just bearing the cold during the day. Another thing is that trips, again, take money to happen, right? I understand and begin to understand even more the privilege that my life really is sneaking towards and how privileged I am to be able to live, uh, you know, have this wonderful job I have. I'm the head gardener at Glensheen Mansion in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, but I get laid off for three months and I can go do these trips um, and I understand that, you know, there's so much privilege with, that gets to, you know, that comes with being able to experience the outdoors in this way. Um, and I, I, that's kind of one of the things that kind of butts up in my head a little bit. But I love remembering this trip because what happened is I just ran out of money. And I ran out of money before I got a tent, actually, which is kind of the thing that you live in when you're tripping like this, right? So this tent uh, was <laughs> a three-season tent, not a four-season tent. It's a 1989 Sierra Designs clip flashlight tent. And it was the most beautiful gift I was ever given. It was the perfect thing in the entire world. And the last roadblock that I ran into was in the first week. And I was hiking. Diggins and I were hiking together. And my knee, my left knee, started, it felt like somebody was just stabbing me with knives in my left knee. I couldn't figure out what was going on. My quad, my quad muscle had pulled on my patella and it was going off track is what ended up happening. It was the worst pain I've ever had. If you've ever had knee surgery in your life, maybe due to age, maybe because of an injury in sports, whatever it would be, that maybe that's just how your body is built, I refuse. It is up there for one of the top five pains I've ever been in. So what ended up happening is that I sat down on the side of this county road in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, sat down just like this, and Diggins curled up in between my knees here, and I put my hood up like this, and I just sat out and I stuck my thumb out. <laughs> and I waited for a family to come pick me up. And a family did come pick me up. Ironically, their name, their, their last name was Winter, which was really awesome. And it was the guy's birthday, and they thought it was the coolest thing that on his birthday, they would help a through hiker get to where she needed to go. The third thing is learn how to lean on people or your dog. Uh, as a solo expeditioner or solo whatever you want to call me, um, sometimes it's really hard to be like, oh, people come along, help me do this thing. But I learned on this trip a little kindness goes a long, long way. We'd be hiking and wind slowly caught that we were hiking this trail in the middle of winter, in the middle of COVID, in the middle of civil unrest and everything else that we all survived. Remember that time? We're still kind of in it a little bit. And they would leave us signs on the trail and it was the coolest thing. I mean, imagine yourself driving down I-35, right? Or up, whatever direction you're going. And on the side of the road is the billboard that's like, insert your name here. You're the greatest person to ever exist. You're doing amazing. I know it feels like it's so difficult, but you can really, like, if you woke up and just saw signs on the sidewalk to your class that told you that you were awesome, like, how much better would your, you'd be like, me? I am. I am awesome. They're right. They're not wrong. And it was amazing because then we got to see these beautiful places in Wisconsin. I mean, these are places that, I mean, you don't really, really, like when you think about Wisconsin, how many of us think of cows? Which I will say, there were, there were a lot of cows there, a lot of cows. Watching Diggins experience her first cow was the biggest delight in my life. She was wondering why there was a gigantic Alaskan Husky that didn't have fur, and it was, she just stood there in shock and awe, and it was awesome. But we think of that, we think of milk, we think of corn, we think of all these things, but actually, they have these hidden gems, just like we do in Minnesota, right? People think the exact same thing about Minnesota, right? And the coolest part about it is that you can hike there. You can get yourself there. It's not actually a secret place, it's just that you've never experienced it yet. And I got to experience it with someone that was quickly becoming my best friend. But remember that I borrowed her, okay? <laughs> Worst decision of my life, but also the best. Another thing that I learned, number four, is that it's difficult but not impossible. Remember the signs I was telling you about? The ones that are like, Emily, you're awesome, you're the coolest thing since sliced bread, right? So we're hiking along, and this fourth grade teacher, she's like, my students have made you signs um, to encourage you along on the road. And I was like, oh, awesome. Like, I love these. It's so, so fun. I would end up meeting these kids later. Not all the kids, 
due to the next slide that'll come up. And I'm hiking along, they're like, Emily, you're great, you're awesome. I get to this sign, right, in the corners we see, you're unstoppable, we believe in you. If you believe in yourself, anything's possible. And then there's this kid, this is a fourth grader. What are you, like eight in fourth grade? And this kid's like, push yourself to hike. <laughs> because nobody else is gonna do it for you. And I was like, I stood, I st I looked at this sign for like a long, hot second. <laughs> and I was on the border of like, not even mad, just curious, and I was like, you know what? You're right. <laughs> Nobody else is out here doing this hike. And this was the thing that like, this is the, this, that sign really, I don't know this kid. I never met this kid. Um, I don't know who raised this kid. Like I really wanna meet this kid's like <laughs> parents mostly. But this fourth grader, this eight or whatever year old, eight, nine, ten year old, was so right, right, for on the trail and in life. Like, sometimes you just have to push yourself towards that extra end because nobody else is living your life for you. Nobody else is going to do this hike for you. Nobody else is going to give this speech except for me, right? Because this is what I'm choosing to do. This is what you're choosing to do. And I was like, this kid for president, honestly. <laughs> And because of that, again, we got to see some magical places in Wisconsin. I mean, there would be days where there would be, you know, if you've ever seen like rind frost or hoar frost on the trees, right? It's when there's a little bit of moisture in the air in the wintertime and it freezes to the trees. And we would go searching for this on the trail and it'd be amazing, beautiful mornings, right? And it was just me and my new best friend, Diggins, experiencing this sweet, extremely quiet place in the middle of Wisconsin. And even road walks became really delightful, right? When the sun was shining and it was just me and her and there weren't trucks screaming by us. It was these quiet, simple moments that we got to live in. Like mornings like this. I remember this, I mean, this trip was several years ago now, but this morning I specifically remember it. I just stood there in the middle of it and I just soaked everything in. It's funny too, because people are like, oh, you know, I can't quite make it out to places like that, and that's okay, because this is actually in Baraboo, Wisconsin, which is a city. Um, and I remember this morning, this was after you know, the whole Christmas town key card cabin situation. Um, some lady had bought me a coffee, and so I was sitting down by the river, and I was like, I wonder how many people in Baraboo know that the sun looks like this on the water. And when we got here, my dogs are in the truck. I just took them for a walk down by the river and like behind some apartments. But it was a really cool little niche spot that I, don't know, I didn't see anybody. It seemed like people hung out down there, maybe go fishing, do other shenanigans. But it was a beautiful little quiet spot. And these spaces you soon to realize are kind of everywhere. You don't have to be a crazy expeditioner to find them. And of course, I mean, honest, honestly. <laughs> Remember that I borrowed her though, okay. Number five, again, which seems redundant but is really important is the leaning into community part. We had people show up, right? So there's trail magic, but the people who are associated with the magic are called trail angels. And I'm just gonna go through a few of them, but know that there were so many more trail angels that I met. This woman specifically here also is a musher. Uh, she runs Sammy's, and they're the fluffy white ones. Um, and she quickly became Diggins' actual best friend because she had raw meat that she was feeding her from that bucket. <laughs> she also made me burritos with cooked meat, and it was, they were, I'm sure, equally delicious for either of us. Lee, he was such a wonderful old man. He actually left me a handwritten note on the trail. He's like, hey, I'm, an, I'm 70 years old. I'm really nice. My kids think I'm cool. I really just wanna make you dinner, is that okay? I'm a line cook, and I was like, you know what? Yes, this is a great option. I walked to his house, he fed me a, like a four course dinner, and then just the next morning, endless bacon and endless eggs. I was like, this dude, anytime. We became really good friends, he, and he comes and visits me actually at work in Glenshine. And Patty Dreyer, she, she's maybe perhaps a hero of them all. Here we are in a blizzard, Diggins and I were hiking on the road, uh, I had met Patty maybe two days before. I had a zero day in between that. And it was a beautiful blizzard, a beautiful ground blizzard, and it was amazing. And I was like, my dog looks so cool in this blizzard. And being the millennial I am, of course, I had to take a video and a photo of her, and I'm like, yes. 
What I forgot was that my glasses don't work really well underneath my goggles, so I would take them off and clip them onto the front of my backpack, just on a little chest strap, and my phone was inside my chest pocket, so I unclip my chest strap, unzip my jacket, take the cool video and photo, of which I don't actually know where it ended up. I have searched for this so that it could be this slide instead of this photo. Put my stuff back together and kept hiking. I hiked for several miles, and I sat down to take a break to eat lunch, and my glasses were nowhere to be found. I dropped my glasses. <laughs> These glasses are on my face right now, which match the earth. They're not like bright pink or bright green. They are brown and black and white and clear somewhere on the road. And here's something that is better about Wisconsin than Minnesota, is their plowing ability, hands down. I don't know about for you guys down here, but where I live, our plowing is kind of a disgrace to all of the people who love snow. What they do is they plow the roads, but then they plow the ditches as well, so it's nice and wide. Well, this is a plowing day. I called Patty and I said, I lost my glasses. Can you, she was the only one I knew, she's the only one I knew that lived close enough. I said, can you possibly maybe drive on the road and see if you can find them, knowing this was kind of a shot in the dark. Two hours later, she drives up behind me, waving my glasses in the air, and she says, are these the glasses you were talking about? And I was like, oh my, this is a miracle, hands down. This is the best trail magic that has ever happened to me. And what happened with her is that a guy in, the tr in a different truck stopped to help her to help me, it is this huge chain effect of trail magic and trail angels. And this guy, I have no idea who he is, he was just really stoked about my trip, and that is sometimes enough to get you on in your day. I corralled this, well this is one half of the couple, but it was a woolen mill. Uh, sometimes on this trip people ask me, well where did you sleep? A lot of it's stealth camping, they don't have very many campsites. So before I left, I called a few places to see if I could sleep on their properties. These folks had lots of sheep, there are lots of sheep and one brazen donkey. And they allowed me to sleep in their pasture with their sheep one night. And I was woken up to that very brazen donkey the next morning. And they were an awesome couple. And they sent us off with one whole dozen of boiled eggs. Which is the funniest trail magic I've ever heard. If you do ever find yourself in the situation of being a trail angel, remember that whoever is the hiker has to carry what you get them. And I will tell you that one dozen eggs is, uh, just imagine where you would put one dozen eggs in your backpack as you're hiking. Finally, Terry Gundrum, she is a Marine. Uh, she was one of two people of color that I saw on the trail, and it was amazing. And she was the only person actually to hike with me. She hiked maybe 18 miles with me and camped out with me one night. She and I continued to, continue to today uh, to be good friends, and uh, it was just nice. It was nice to see one other brown face on the trail. Number six is rest, something I'm not the best at. There are people that allowed us to spend nights at their place. They would shuttle us back and forth, called, it's kind of called slack packing. Uh, so I could leave my stuff at their place. I could hike or run. Some days I would just run the miles with Diggins, and then they would come pick me up so we could loop back around um, when the weather was really bad, and they let us take multiple zero day zero days at their place, and it was amazing. Also, we were able to rest, and I gave up a lot of my food because people kept leaving us so much food on the trail. It is a remarkable thing. They left Diggins maybe more food than they left me, <laughs> but equally so, it was great. A happy dog is happy for anything. <laughs> this is from Lake Michigan. It was a really windy day on Lake Michigan, and we both looked like this, but she's way more attractive than I am <laughs> when she has ice on her face. Um, and because of that, we got to, again, experience all these really cool places and, and, and become even better friends, honestly. One of the hardest things I learned on this trip is that emotions are real. Um, I am a lot German, and I am a lot Polish, and I don't know if there's any Germans or Poles in the room. Uh, maybe you grew up also with parents or grandparents that think that emotions are the worst thing to ever exist. So if you feel anything, you just shove it down <laughs> or go outside and chop a cord of wood and put all the emotions into that one cord of wood. But that's exactly how I grew up. I'm extremely thankful for my entire family. Uh, but if we could have just tweaked one thing in my childhood, it would be how do we deal with emotions? Uh, there did come a time where I had to say goodbye to Diggins because remember I borrowed her, right? Uh, we were at the end, cameras were rolling, right? Because um, 
at mile 500, some dude messaged me on Instagram being like, I wanna make a documentary out of this. And I was like, I don't think so. And he's like, then his wife's like, my husband's really nice. And I was like, fine. <laughs> right, so now there's cameras everywhere. And I'm chit-chatting with somebody and Diggins is on my left side. And then Sherry comes up to me and she says, I think it's time for Diggins to go home. And I said, okay. <laughs> and then I did that. I crumbled to the ground. I, I had prepared a speech. I had prepared everything I was gonna say because you know, film, and it all just went to the wayside and I bawled hard and it was terrible. One of the things that people don't know about awesome trips like this is that the trip ends. I don't know how many of you have ever had a really, really high experience in your life where it, a mountaintop experience, maybe literally, maybe figuratively, maybe you've also been on a long trip like this, but what happens is that you come home and it all ends. And your simple purpose of waking up, hiking, taking care of your dog and going to sleep and experiencing cool things goes away. A lot of people hit what is called the post-hike blues, which is a fancy term for depression. So after I got back, I hit a very, very low hole, right? I had a partner at the time, and they tried all they could to help me get out of this hole, and there was literally nothing that could do it. It is something that happens to a lot of people, and it's really unfortunate. Um, and that's why you see people taking trip after trip after trip to kind of keep that at bay. But there are ways to deal with it, right? One of the things that we decided to do is I asked to borrow Diggins again for one more weekend, and again, our love was in a flurry. And I offered Sherry, I said, I will buy this dog free from you for any possible amount. I will tell you that I am very much in the middle class, but I was willing to take out a loan to buy this dog if I needed to. And she had to talk to her daughter, and we just waited on this text message, and she said, yeah, you can have her. I said, well, how much do you want for her? And she says, no, I don't think you understand. She said, I think that you and Diggins have a really special relationship, and we'd like for you to have her for free. And I was like, this is the best Christmas ever. <laughs> and so she's out in my truck now, which is amazing. She, having her around, did not cure everything, right? Um, but she did help get me out of that hole. One of the things that really helps if you ever find yourself in that situation is get out and do little things that make you happy. It doesn't have to be a lot of the whole thing, but I would get out for just a little bit of time and a little bit of time and a little bit of time. And eventually, I saw the sunlight again, which, thank goodness. The eighth thing I learned is remember your impact. When I started this trip, my sister is the one who told me to start an Instagram. I would never have started an Instagram. I am social media-ly, media I'm socially, nope. <laughs> I'm not great with social media, is what I'm trying to say, um, clearly. And she's like, you have to have somewhere to store your photos so you can share it with people. And Facebook was really on its way out as it is still on the trend down. And so I said, okay. Uh, and then. Uh, first week into the trip, I looked open up my Instagram to do my once a week post on Sunday, and all of a sudden a thousand people were following along, and I was like, what? This must be like a bunch of robots, I don't know what they're trying to do, gang up on me or whatever, and then 2,000 people started following. Then I really understood that there's a larger impact that's happening, right? George Floyd was murdered, there's a bunch of civil unrest. My sister is amazing at showing up physically and vocally. She will protest, she'll put her body on the line, she's actually a sheriff. She does all these things to be, you know, up front. And she was a cop, she was a cop at the time, is a sheriff now. That is not the way that I live. So the question that I had for myself is, for people who look like me, and for people who experience um, harm to black bodies, how can I show up for them in the way that I show up for myself and show up naturally? And hiking is the way that I do it. I know that if I can show, if when I was younger, oh my goodness, if there was like some black woman hiking a trail when I was younger, I would have been like, yo, now, backpack, on it. But I didn't. It isn't something I really got to see. But I do want to show up for kids like this age. I want to show up for adults. I want to show up for anybody who feels, looks, even has an inkling, has been told that they can't and are different, right? You know, one thing that black people get is like, we can't swim for some reason. I don't know who made that up. I'm a great swimmer, I will tell you. But there are things like that, that where you're just told growing up and experiencing, but I want to change that dynamic, right? I want to be a face 
of a person that is doing something that seems strange or weird for a black person to do, so that it's just normalized. I always tell people that I'm so excited for the day when my story is so boring and nobody really cares that I even exist because so many people of color and so many different bodies are on the trail, right? So many different abled bodies and, and disabled bodies are on the trail because everything will be way more equitable. Number nine is you never know where your yes or your no is gonna lead you. Right, so from this trip, what happened after that? That's always a big question. I ended up skiing across the boundary wires with Diggins, right? One of the ways that I decided to um, get out of my post like blues, again, like I said, which people do, is to just take another trip. And so I was planning another trip to ski across the boundary waters and to fight for a place that is really important, right? And experience a wonderful, beautiful place that people don't even know exist in the world. We are so lucky to have the Boundary Waters to the north of us, and I live so very close to it, and I feel so very thankful. And again, I got to do it with my best friend, who is my eternal best friend now, right? Because she's mine. And it was amazing to fight for her place and to show up and be a body there in the winter so that we always remember that this place is not forgotten. And there's been people, I mean, indigenous people, let us remember, have been using the Boundary Waters and have lived. I mean, it's their place, honestly, let's be honest. I was just a visitor. But sometimes we forget that people exist there and I wanted to be effaced for that in all seasons. And it was awesome. It was amazing to learn how to live in even colder weather. I experienced um, anywhere minus 40, minus 50 nights sometimes. Still took the same sleeping bag, but added on to it. <laughs> so I had a setup where I had a zero degree bag with a zero degree quilt, uh, which can, is good down to about minus 50, minus 60, and really learned how to use hot water bottles. And of course, lived in this beautiful tent, in this beautiful space. What I also learned is to go outside, which is funny for me to say, you're like, Emily, you're always outside, you're a gardener, you're an adventurer. Sometimes though, I love, don't be mesh that I don't love a good scroll sesh in the bathroom. I waste so much time just scrolling, and I love, I'm so fulfilled by just scrolling. Oof, the swipe, I tell you. Netflix, I love Netflix. YouTube, I'm all over it. Never be mistaken that I live this luxurious life where I'm always outside and like, hashtag van life, no. I drive a Dodge Ram, <laughs> I'm a gardener, I love the internet, I love social media, like it's, it's okay that you love all these things. If you're a gamer, if you love books, if you knit, if you do all these things, the outdoors is still for you. But with this whole yes or no situation, I said yes to a very important person in my life. And I got to live in Alaska for the last three months. I just got back uh, in March. And I got to experience the aurora in a way I've never been able to see. I've, I actually had never seen it before moving there. I got to experience racing for the first time. I got to drive a dog sled. I was a handler for my partner, who's a musher. She's gonna do Iditarod next year. And I got to learn how to live with 30 dogs. And I got to see beautiful places. I saw so many moose. It was amazing. But it was only because I said yes, literally to one person. Actually, I, I asked her and she said yes. And so we both said yes. So sometimes it's the yes, sometimes it's the no but you will never know where that's gonna lead you to. And it's kind of always up to you, right? The last story of saying yes and no. Have you ever thought about like where your story starts from? Right? Like how did I get to, how did I get to Alaska slash how did I get here? For me, my story of this starts way back in junior high when I wanted to follow in my sister's footsteps. She was in track and field throwing uh, shot put in discus, and I wanted to be the same as her, so I did that. And because of that, I ended up at Gustavus Adolphus College. And because of that, I met my roommate. And because of that, I ended up in Duluth, because we decided to not go back to our parents' houses after graduating college. And because of that, I ended up knowing the Superior Hiking Trail. And also because of that, I ended up working at Glensheen. And because of that, I met uh, my ex, and because of that, I got to be encouraged by that person to start hiking more. And because of that, I ended up on the Ice Age Trail, and because of that, I ended up in the Boundary Wars, and because of that, I met my current partner, and because of that, I ended up in Alaska, and because of that, here I am talking to you guys, right? 
So if you ever forget what you're doing and why you're doing something in your life, just think about where everything started and where your line is going. But thank you, Carleton College, for having me here today. This was really awesome. Thank you very much, Emily. What an outstanding way to start the convocation program for this term. So once again, thank you for being here. Quick question, how do we find wonderful speakers for convocation? You. If you go to the convocation site, there's a place where you can submit the speaker's uh, f suggestion form. That's how we found Emily, and we're very grateful for that. We're very, I'm sorry, I don't remember who submitted it, but thank you to that person or those people. Uh, then we have a convocation committee that considers them. If you sent a suggestion in and you haven't heard anything, it's okay to poke me. I'm getting old and forgetful. Nponder at carleton.edu. Give me a reminder. Another announcement is lunch. If you signed up for lunch, we'll be in AGH as always. Please follow friend Beth. Is here. There's, there's Beth over to AGH. If you did not sign up for luncheon and would like to sign up, we have a whopping four spaces left. So the first four people to stampede up here after convocation ends, give me, uh, just let me know. Okay, but now it's time for Q&A with Emily. So who would like to start us off with a question or a comment? Hi, I follow you on Instagram. <laughs> um, so you've told us all these really uplifting stories, but I know there was, must have been, maybe, maybe not, moments when it was kind of scary and you were like out there in the middle of some frozen lake and you, it was, it, you, you were, it was scary. Tell us one of those stories. I, yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot of those stories. I actually have quite a good time when I'm backpacking. Um, probably maybe the worst for most people would be uh, skiing across the boundary waters. Uh, there was one night we were by a river. I will tell you that whenever you see open water, you love that in the wintertime because snowflakes are 90% air, and to boil snow into water takes one million years precisely. So we were next to a river, set up the tent. I was looking for a portage, spent a lot of time, really sweaty, really tired, really hungry. I ended up falling through the ice that night, up to my chest. And so it's one of those, it's one of those things where like, that could be a really hard moment, um, but I'm, and you know, because I'm by myself, and Diggins is literally sleeping through this whole event. Um, but it is one of those things of like, this really sucks, this really sucks, this really sucks, but, there's nobody else out here to help me out. If I press an SOS button, they're not gonna be here for another day. So I kinda have to do these things on my own. And a lot of times, the hardest parts is just the everyday slog of like, the wind just eating your face with snowflakes, right? Um, you're too hot, you're too cold. It's a lot of like the little everyday things is kind of the hardest parts sometimes. Hi, Emily. I'm so glad you're here. I loved one of your very first comments about finding a place in nature, even right here in Northfield or right in Baraboo, Wisconsin, because it's so important that we all recognize that there's nature right outside our doors. So I don't know if you want to comment on that a little bit more, but I'm always, I run the Arboretum here, and I'm always trying to get people to recognize that they don't have to go very far to have these experiences. Right. Uh... Yeah, I was, thank you for coming, because you're the Arboretum person they were talking about, which is cool. Uh, if you, and I heard you guys have a rip and arb here, and honestly, like, use it, because when you move and leave college, Arboretums sometimes are hard to find. Uh, curated trees are really hard to find. A lot of people ask me, like, how do I get started if I've never done this before? I'm really scared. How do I, blah, 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 like, blah. Start where you are, and even if you're in a concrete jungle, there are, a, there are still birds, there are still squirrels, there are still things to look at. Um, and all of a sudden, when you have your phone in airplane mode, hot tip, airplane mode, awesome, your phone still works as a camera, nobody can call you or text you. Oof, oof, it's amazing. Um, but if you just walk around with the intentionality of being aware of what's around you, I promise you will see and find things that you didn't even know existed in the place that you live.
This is a practical question. What do you carry in your uh, emergency kit for you and Diggins? Like our med kit or? Your first aid kit. <laughs> oh, uh, the usual stuff, anything that would be uh, extra um, is one change of base layers is a big deal. Um, but nothing, I'm trying to think if there's anything out of the ordinary on it. Uh, maybe something that people use is called Musher's Secret. It's really good for a dog's paws. It's a sallow for a dog's paws. It also helps the snow not stick so much if you have a dog that has really furry paws. Um, but other than that, um, I can't, I, there's nothing that's really up far You didn't beyond. have any physical injuries that you or Dickens that you had to? We stay mostly injury free, just on the first trip where I had that knee injury. I have been extremely fortunate uh, to have very few injuries on my trip. Um, but yeah. So I did a backpacking trip once. It was like two days and a night, and I had like zero training, and it sucked. Um, so what kind of uh, preparation and training do you do for these long hikes? Such a good question. Um, it, sometimes not much. <laughs> sometimes a lot. Uh, for trips like this, we do something called a shakeout or a shakedown, and it's using your gear for a shorter trip like just a couple nights or like three nights or four nights um, to see what you like and what you don't like. Um, and I've learned to do that a lot more effectively, especially after the Ice Age Trail. Um, one of the things is think about like why that trip sucked for you. Um, do you want to do it again? Because here's the other thing. I'm going to be honest with you. If you try going out, if you try the outdoors and you hate it, try it again. If you still hate it, Yo, that's fine. You don't like it. You like being inside, and that is fine. I'm not here to judge anybody that wants to spend 24 hours not in the sunlight, as long as you have tried it. Um, I will say my very first trip that I took by myself, my backpack was so heavy because I used glass jars. Do not take glass. <laughs> For so many reasons, it's bad, for, it's bad for the trail, it's bad for you, it's bad for your back. My backpack was heavy. Um, I also forgot bug spray, and I went like in July, and this was in northern Minnesota. I don't know what is wrong with my blood type, but I am so attractive to mosquitoes. I spent every day with a very heavy backpack, no trekking poles, and mosquitoes eating me alive. It was perhaps one of the hardest trips I ever took, and it was three days long also. So, you can... Go with other people. You can try. Uh, you can just do an overnighter, kind of figure, suss, like figure out what's good or bad with your gear. Um, you can never do it again. You can take a dog with you. You can go somewhere new. It, it could have been the climate that you hated. I don't know what was bad about your trip, I guess. It kind of depends. Um, but there's so many different types of experiences that you can have outside. Something that I learned quickly is that my body is oddly curvy for as much as I don't want it to be. That's the body I was given. And so for me to sleep on the ground, I have to have a bougie, bougie sleeping pad. And that's one of the things I've always splurged on because sleep for me is really important. And that has really enhanced my outdoor trip experience. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, I was wondering if you had a luxury item or a little treat that you carried and would look forward to on the challenging days. <clears throat> In the boundary waters. Uh, I, actually learned, I, I actually learned this from somebody. Uh, she's a polar explorer. She takes people to the North and South Pole. And she actually brings a ukulele with her every time. I did not know how to play ukulele. I still scarcely know how to play ukulele. But it fits in my polk bag, in my sled bag, really well. It's an extremely light instrument. And at the end of the day, to just like strum a little bit and like pretend that you're a songwriter and like make songs in your concert hall, aka your tent, is, was such a fun way to end my days. Uh, even if my fingers were chilly, if I, like, I did it for like two minutes. But like if I would build a fire on the ice, like hanging out, waiting for my water to boil. I would just kind of hang out and play ukulele. So good morning um, and thank you for coming. Uh, two quick, well maybe not two quick questions, but the first question relates to sort of how do you get more underrepresented people to be outdoor enthusiasts in the sense of hiking? 
Um, I think our CANU student organization has done a really good job of trying to um, diversify uh, the folks that, that do it on campus. And so any thoughts of, uh, about that and how you came into loving this outdoor piece? Um, the second part is do you do any sort of group trips um, or have you ever thought about um, hosting sort of group, group trips? For the first question, I love this question because the way I got out really the first time is that my friends, my childhood best friend's family brought me to the Boundary Waters for uh, like a graduation trip for the both of us. And that was my first experience of the Boundary Waters. I was uh, 18, 17 or 18. And I literally never went back to the Boundary Waters until I lived there uh, a couple years ago. Um, so that's my biggest tip is that Sometimes you have, to, you have to go to the people and get the people and bring the people, right? Go build relationship, build trust, and bring them with you to the things that you think are awesome, right? Sometimes a poster is not going to do it because people don't know what you're doing, right? Um, unless they're extremely curious and feel extremely safe. A lot of people ask me, like, how do you get kids to get outside? Like, how do you get more kids of color to go outside? And, like, sometimes you've got to drive to their house and pick them up and put them in your car with their parents or guardians' permission, <laughs> and then drive them to the wilderness and show them what you're doing. Um, a lot of that, that is actually, that's exactly how I got outside, is by that. Uh, the grand question, do I do anything? No, I don't. <laughs> I, I have not led a group trip. Um, I, am, I am in the phase of just tripping myself, which is really fun. Um, one day, it is my, life goal, one of my life goals one day, is that I'm hoping that my partner and I, we have a sled dog kennel, and that we can bring anybody, but especially kids of colors, to come hang out with the sled dogs and drive sleds. Because one of the biggest things to me is that dogs have always been a huge part of my story. Always. I've always had a dog in my life. For a lot of people of color, for a lot of black folks, dogs are not allies. And that is one of the most heartbreaking things to me ever because a very sweet animal has been used to abuse people of color, right? And I would love to just close the gap in there and show kids the wilderness, number one, uh, and to show them that there's this really cool animal that wants to love on you also and work with you. Um, so that's the road. That's a really far down, that's a really, really far down dream. Uh, for now, if somebody invited me, to go do a trip and help guide a trip? I think I would go help guide. Can I guide a trip on my own? I don't have any formal training in full-on guiding on my own. So that's where I'm, to be quite transparent, that's where I'm at, of course. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, you talked about how like you started by moving to Duluth and like getting more involved in hiking, and then like how did you get from there to like hiking the Ice Age Trail? Like, at what moment did you realize like you had the skills and like the confidence to do something so like so long? That's a really good question. I didn't have the skills. Cool. <laughs> Let's remember that. Um, I had just done short trips. I had hiked the Superior Hiking Trail, which is about 300 miles. So I did have skills. That's not true. Um, and one, you kind of realize that if you can do a four-night trip, you can do a week-long trip, and you can do pretty much a month-long trip at that point. You can do a month-long trip, you can do a two-month-long trip. It kind of just compounds on top of you know, yourself itself. Um, but for through hikers, a thousand miles is like kind of one peak that you reach, like the gateway to becoming a real through hiker. Not true. Um, and I was out playing volleyball with my buddy at the bar one night, and I was like, I really want to hike a thousand miles next winter. And she told me about the Ice Age Trail. And I was like, literally, there's not a great story. I was like, great. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did it the next, like, it's bad. I, then I did it the next year. I will say, though, that I took a couple months to research and get everything ready uh, for that trip. I didn't just walk out of my house and go. And I Googled a lot. There's a lot of forums. I definitely spent a lot of time online researching. Uh, to see what other people have done for like winter survival day after day. Actually, we have a question from Zoom, so I'm going to uh, 
convey that to you as I'm going through the pews here. And it kind of ties in with a question I have. Somebody on Zoom asked, do you keep Diggins on a leash? And I was going to ask, kind of same line, did, did you ever have any scary Diggins moments like squirrel, gone, or cow, gone, or anything? And it's like, where's Diggins? Diggins has always attached me. Yeah, she goes, she has attached me by a skijuring line. Um, and she actually has great recall now, uh, which I did not know that she would have, but she's always been attached to me. I don't know how she learned to recall. I never taught it to her. Uh, but when we live in Alaska, uh, she was off leash the whole time. Um, and she and her gal pals would look for free fish to bury. Um, but on, while we're out tripping, she's usually attached to me. Uh, unless in camp, when I like set up the tent, she knows what home means. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, thanks for coming. I did a project for a class called Wilderness Studies um, about queer community in wilderness, and I'm curious how queerness fits into your story. I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's it. <laughs> uh, you know, it is another box that I check, um, and as a person who checks a lot of boxes, um, it is the one that gives me the least amount of trouble. I think most people think I'm a dude walking around, so lots of people don't give me trouble to begin with, which misgendering has been a part of my life since day one, which, whatever. That means I get to use both bathrooms if I so choose. It's nice. Never a line at the men's bathroom, I'll tell you that. Um, it didn't really hit me too hard until last summer I was invited to go do a, a queer Boundary Waters trip. Um, with folks who have had a little bit more, have had way more issues than I've ever had in the wilderness. And that's where a lot of stories uh, that I started listening to finally came about and like hit my heart. But for me, I've done things alone for so long um, that it hasn't been too much of an issue. And also, I didn't really come out until I was much older. In my late 20s, really unfortunate. Come out earlier if you can, if it's possible for you. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of learning that I have to do. I've been black my whole life, but being okay with being queer is a little different and has hit me a little differently. So I haven't really noticed as much. But I will say it was a really fun trip to take with a bunch of gay people um, or different identifying people on, in the Boundary Waters. It's kind of a freeing situation to figure out where I fit in in a community that I'm a part of. Hello, thank you, this has been wonderful. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on your adventures in Alaska. Did you have a favorite place? And then a second question, do you have any future adventures planned? Uh, yeah, so Alaska was awesome. Uh, we lived in Willow, Alaska. My partner still lives there. Um, and it will be home pretty soon. And we did not leave Willow very often unless we were racing, so she was getting ready for all of her qualifiers. To run a Diderod, you'd need one 200-mile race and two 300-mile races to qualify to run the 1,000-mile race uh, the next year, or whenever you so choose. So we just kind of hammered out, really, just races. And if we weren't racing, we were training dogs, so we were just running dogs all the time. We rarely left Willow. We would go to Anchorage to go shopping, or Wasilla to go shopping, which are kind of boring places. If you ever get to go there, I would highly recommend Talkeetna. We took one little like mini vacation in Talkeetna. It's a really cute little mountain town. If you have, ever have um, time to go there, I would highly recommend just Alaska in the winter in total. I know summer is like a great time, but uh, winter is kind of a prime time also. Uh, future trips? Um, yeah, anything. This, I think this next, since Anna's going to be running I Did Rod uh, in March next year, I will, I think I'm just going to do the Superior Hiking Trail in the winter, um, add a tag on a few other trails, just maybe 500 miles, and then head back out to Alaska to help train dogs, and then she'll do that. Uh, but a lifelong goal later on, maybe like five years out, would be to ski across Greenland. That's kind of a thing in my heart that I'd like to do. Another thing that I'd like to do is just kind of unearth these, um, trails that people don't know about. It was kind of like a dream of mine once to do the big three, the PCT, the AT, and the CDT, um, but they don't really need my boot marks on those trails. There's plenty of people hiking those trails. I really want to unearth 
trails that people don't know about, especially in the Midwest, but I hope anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world would be awesome. I kind of want to advocate for the underdog. Um, hi, when you had the post-trail blues, did you kind of know that once you got back outdoors, like everything would be fine again? Or like, did you have faith that that would happen? Or were you not really sure like where to go from there when you were in that dark place? I was not sure at all. This is, and this is something that somebody warned me about. I was on a podcast while I was on the trail and like after the podcast, this lady's like, yo, be careful when you get home. People get really sad really quick when they get home. I was like, I'm fine. I'm, I don't know why I thought I was better than that. I'm not, but I'm normal. I'm a normal human who gets sad. Um, so I wasn't sure what was gonna work. I tried everything. Like I didn't wanna drive my truck. I didn't wanna see people. Like I didn't wanna do anything that I liked at all. It kind of just all seemed overwhelming. And um, I ended up walking a lot of places just like instead of driving and just like trying to experience that. Um, I just, I kind of tried little things that I just liked, but I didn't know if anything was gonna work. I was like, this is gonna last forever. And it did last, a, don't let this be like, oh, I went outside once and it was awesome. No, this lasted almost a whole year after until I started planning for the Boundary Waters. And getting back from the Boundary Waters, I learned one of the reasons why I hit such a low point is that when I got back from the Ice Age Trail, I started doing interviews the day after I got back. And I had multiple interviews every single day um, for months straight, right? Not every single day, but multiple times a week, multiple, multiple times a week. When I got back from the Boundary Waters, I told all media, all social media, I said, I'm not gonna do anything. I'm not gonna talk to you for at least seven days when I get back home. And that made a huge, huge difference to give myself space to come back, find myself, and uh, keep moving on with living. So if you ever take a long trip, give yourself space when you come home. It's okay to not talk to anybody. And I believe we have time for one last question, or if you had one last comment or story that you really wanted to tell, I'll, I'll let you have the choice. I'll take another question, yeah. Okay, because I think we have one right here. Quick question, uh, talk to me about your food on the trail. Did you use dehydrated camp food? Did you use unprocessed food? How, what did you do on that? And I'm a hiker, so I have this question. Yeah, for sure. Food is such a big deal. Um, I use a lot of Mountain House, a lot of freeze-dried meals. Uh, they're awesome. They're really lightweight. If one day I can own a dehydrator, I will, I will or freeze-dryer, I will probably freeze-dry my own food because they'll just be cheaper. They're really expensive. Um, but there was a, there's a brand called Green Belly Meals. They have bars that are 700 calories, which is a huge deal. Like, that's a lot of calories, and they're really lightweight and easily packable. So those were kind of the things. Um, one cool thing about winter is that things don't spoil in the winter time. So you can bring whatever you want, like cheese. And I loved eating cheese in the Boundary Water. I would make a quesadilla every single night, and it was kind of a treat. Can you ask me earlier, like, what's a treat? Is between the quesadillas and the ukulele uh, that really made my day. I would think about quesadillas all day long. Um, and I would still even bring uh, ramen just for like an extra meal during the daytime. It's not a lot of calories, but it's a lot of salt. It makes you nice and thirsty. All right, well on that note, we need to say thank you very much, Emily, for being here. Thank you all for being here, and that concludes Convocation for today.